our call to confession comes from God's Word in Psalm 71. It says, I cry to the Lord, aloud to the Lord, and He will hear me. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has His steadfast love forever ceased? Are His promises at, at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has He in anger shut up His compassion? And we'll read our prayer of confession uh, together, which will be on the screen. We cry aloud to You, O Lord, that You might hear us. The troubles of our times disturb us. We meditate on You, O God, and on Your purposes. We wonder if our sins have utterly cut us off from you. Will you spurn us forever, O God, and never again be favorable? Lord, we offer no defense, no excuse, no blame. We confess our sin with repentance, and we meditate on your saving acts of liberation and redemption for your people through the ages. You are a wonder worker. Clean up our lives. Scrub our hearts, scour our minds, that we might be your faithful servants, O God. Your way is holy. You are a holy God, and you have promised to make us a holy people. We trust in you alone. Pour out upon us the purifying fire of righteousness and justice. Unite us to Jesus Christ, that we might be holy as he is holy. For it is in Christ Jesus that we come to you. To you be all the glory, now and evermore. Amen. As we have confessed our sins, he assures us uh, with his pardon. Again, back in Psalm 77. Your way, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You wish your arm, you with your arm redeemed your people, the children of God and Joseph.
thank you for being that fount of our blessing in every time, time of war, time of peace, time of prosperity, time of hardship. You are that fount of every blessing. All we ask of you this morning, Lord, is allow us to be in the presence of that fountain. Seal our hearts for your purpose, so that for your courts above, Lord, for no other purpose, for no other reason, so that others can see the name of Jesus and reach you us. I ask for a blessing in service. I ask for a blessing on each of you here this morning. In Jesus' name. We um, pick up in the uh, third chapter of Romans where we left off last week and you may or may not remember that the question at the end of last week was really a charge. There were people charging Paul with not caring about the law, that the scandal of grace was setting in and then they were totally not understanding it and misapplying it. And so we pick up in... Uh, on verse 9 in uh, the letter to the Romans, the Word of God. What then? Are we any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law come knowledge of sin. Amen. One of the reasons for working our way through books of the Bible in an expository fashion is that all Scripture is God-breathed. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for, re, uh, for correction and for training in righteousness, as 2 Timothy 3.16 says. And the theme that runs, or at least a theme that runs throughout the book of Romans is the righteousness of God. So being trained in righteousness because the righteousness of God is important uh, is is a, uh, a, an ongoing matter for us. And so over the previous weeks, we've heard expose the blatant unrighteousness of much of the Gentile world in, in the first chapter. And then we heard expose the hypocritical righteousness of the moralizers in the first 16 verses of chapter 2. And then it focused on the confident self-righteousness of the Jewish people who uh, were missing the incongruity of having the law but not keeping the law. And that brings us to where we are today. Now, if, if you recall vampire movies... One of, the, one of the characteristics of a vampire in, in regards to a mirror is what? No reflection. No reflection. They can't see themselves in the mirror. If you Google why, it's all over the place. Which is kind of interesting being there are no vampires. But anyway. <laughs> at the heart, there's no soul. Paul highlights the universality of sin in the human race. One of the problems encountered is that people do not tend to see themselves in the mirror of God's Word. James, in the first chapter, will pick up on that mirror imagery contrasting the doers of the Word to those who are only hearers of the Word. He says it's like looking in a mirror and immediately walking away and forgetting what you saw. So in our passage this morning, Paul makes this clear, that the overriding thing, overriding all differences in the human race of class, of race, of language, 
of environment, age, culture, whatever our differences, there's the somber fact that we all share in unity that we are under sin. Verse 9. We have a lot in common with everyone. The awful togetherness of the human race that takes precedence over every other similarity or dissimilarity is this thing before God. We're all exposed in our sinfulness. And even when we want to help God out and point out someone else, we got the three fingers pointing back at us. So we use the phrase under, we're under sin, we use the phrase under uh, as something metaphorically speaking at times. We'll say uh, regarding our work that we're buried under work right now, right? Or we'll say about debt, we're just covered up in debt right now and it's not a good thing. It's too much is what we're saying. It's overwhelming. It's a weight and it's a crushing burden upon us. And here Paul seems to personify sin as this tyrant that is holding the human race imprisoned in guilt and under judgment. And so this is the universal bondage of sin and guilt. And so the apostle asks in verse 9, are we any better off? Now, in the ESV it says, are we Jews any better off? And we know in the very first verse that Already there had been a reference made uh, with the Jews, and then what advantage has, a, has the Jew? And the point was being made there that the Jew and the Gentile both had the same sin problem. In verse 9, the Greek actually doesn't have the word Jew. And so because the previous section clearly was speaking that, some translations helpfully include that, but it's not actually there. And I I find myself in agreement with the New Testament scholar William Hendrickson who says that that there there seems to be a a shift here. And and remember that as we have been in Romans, we have seen that the Apostle Paul has been throwing this net wider and wider and wider to make sure everyone gets the message, you're not left out. You are not the one perfect one. Me and Jesus, we're the two perfect ones in the world. No, no, we're not. We're not. So it's possible that Paul is doubling down on the contrast made earlier. But I hear him, he says, we. Are we any better off? And I understand him to be saying, Christians, left in our natural state, are we any better off? No, we're, we're not either. And the answer from the scriptures he gives is none is righteous, no, not one, verse 10. So apart from Jesus, there's never been a human being who has perfectly kept the law of God and can be judged by that standard and be declared righteous. And this is what is meant by the teaching of total depravity. Not a favorite doctrine, but an important doctrine, and a very misunderstood doctrine. So let's hear what what Paul's saying because it's so clear here what he's saying. Total depravity does not mean that human beings are totally depraved. It doesn't mean that we're as evil as we could be. It doesn't mean we're devoid of decency, devoid of humanity. It is not utterly depraved. It is not completely depraved. It means that the reaches of sin have affected every aspect of our humanity. That's what it means. Our will, our intellect, our emotions, our sexuality, our motivations, every aspect. There's not one spot that has been left pure. It's all been affected. And to communicate that, Paul uses uh, an approach that was common to the rabbis of the time uh, of, of stringing together scriptures that have to do and pertain to a particular uh, idea. And so we find him doing that in verses uh, 11 through, through 18. And what does he use? He, he, uh, this, 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 this it's called karaz. That's what they called it. Literally a stringing of pearls. And so the pearls of Scripture are being strung together to show how comprehensively it speaks to an issue. 
And here the imagery relates to body parts, right? The throat, tongue, lips, mouth, feet, and eyes. It's all encompassing. He's saying from head to toe, total depravity. We have been affected in our totality by sin. Not that we are as terrible, as bad, as evil as we could be. Not at all. Pointing to the utter need for a full and complete and total redemption. You see, we don't just need a pair of crutches. Sometimes people say, well, Christianity, that's just a crutch. Christianity has never been taught as a crutch. It is not a crutch. What it is is a total life support system. Have you ever seen a pair of crutches propped up next to a coffin? just in case they need it. No. Because dead people don't need crutches. Dead people need life. And people who are dead in their trespasses and sin don't need crutches. We need to be born again and have a new life in Christ. And that's where Paul is is going. This is the point that he is driving to in this. The basic reason, the underlying reality of all this is expressed in verse 18, that there is no fear of God before their eyes. And there he's quoting from Psalm 36, verse 1. And so the consistent operation of the holy fear of God in human hearts brings about in us a, a desire for the reconciliation with God and a reconciliation with our fellow human beings. That's what the Holy Spirit generates in us, and a lack of respect for God creates an alarming vacuum in a human being. And a vacuum, as you know, will be filled with something, but it's not good. A commercial ran after the State of the Union Uh, addressed by President Biden this week, featuring a man, a a pretty well-known man, who presented himself, introduced himself as a lifelong atheist. And he he then spoke about his support for the constitutional separation of church and state, and which, of course, is not in the Constitution, but never mind that. It was from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote uh, in regards to that. Uh, the, the, The Constitution forbids the establishment of a religion. The state cannot establish a religion. And, and, and I would, you know, that, that's a wise and good thing. No state-sponsored religion. Many of our founders came from countries where there was a state-sponsored religion. They didn't want that. But the church is not over the state. Other founders came from places where the church was over the state. They didn't want that either. But a proper understanding would say that this separation he was talking about, it was never intended, never, never, never was it intended that people of faith would check their faith at the door when they go to do the business of the state. Never. That was not the purpose of it. In fact, think about it. That would be requiring, if that was required, then that requires the very hypocrisy and duplicity that we see being addressed in the book of Romans so far, pointing out the problem with that. That is, if the state was to say, as this man was saying, that the norm for people of faith serving in politics is that they leave their faith at the door. What is that actually requiring? Why would there be an encouragement for politicians to be hypocritical and deceitful? They need no encouragement. (laughs) But there is a blindness to that truth. If you say you must leave your faith at the door, you're saying that you can say one thing, but when you come in here, say something else, and we think it's perfectly fine because that's what we do, and it's not. It's not, and that was never intended. And so the commercial concluded with him restating that he was a lifelong atheist and that, no, he was not afraid of hell. Understand, this is a decent man. 
a reasonable man, a respectful human being. But as verse 18 says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. And that's what total depravity is. Total depravity does not mean anyone is beyond salvation because that's the state of humanity. That's is where Paul is going. The point he is driving at is that there is none who are righteous. No, not one. And it's ironic. In our search for common ground amongst humanity, the one place we don't look is this thing that we all share, that we're all together in subjection to sin. If left to our sin, we're in condemnation for it. And we all share an absolute necessity for salvation and for grace. All people stand in desperate need of salvation. And that salvation is freely offered in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and it's applied to human hearts by the Holy Spirit. So this portion of Romans concludes in verses 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So neither law nor lawlessness. The law cannot save because all people are lawbreakers. Remember, Jesus summed up the law in two, two phrases. He said, you want to keep the law? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And then he taught the parable about the Good Samaritan to make clear that your neighbor isn't only people that you like, people that are just like you, that it can be people far different and that you don't really care for and they don't really care for you either. That's your neighbor. Love them all. Every day. All day. No days off. No weekend passes. That's the requirement. Does the law really apply to all people? Well, Paul has addressed this as well. Uh, and he says in verse 2 of uh, chapter 3 that the oracles of God were given to the Jews. And that increased their knowledge and their awareness of God, and it increased their responsibility towards God and their brothers and sisters. The call of the Jewish people was to bring the light and knowledge of God to the nations. Isaiah 42, 6 and many other passages we could look to. They were entrusted to do that. The call to Father Abraham was that he would be the father of many nations. Genesis 17, verse 5. And as we come into Romans 4 in a couple weeks, we'll see uh, that again there. But many who had the law had turned inward. They've kind of become ingrown and self-satisfied and they missed the point of the entrustment of the law to them. And it makes me wonder, what about us who are followers of Jesus Christ? And we would say, well, we're not under the law, we're under, the, under grace. But what does that mean? Because it's neither law nor lawlessness. It's one thing to not be under law, but that doesn't mean lawlessness. I know the word you're thinking, antinomianism. He's talking about antinomianism now. Well, I am, you're right. That is the word, anti, against the law, or contrary to the law, believing things different and, and trying to live apart from God's law. No. Well, what law of God? Well, that's important that we distinguish that because it creates some confusion at times, and sometimes we'll be charged. Well, if you think this law is important about morality, why don't you think the law about kosher things are important? See, you don't believe that. Well, let's just clarify this. There are three levels of law. There is judicial law, and the judicial law was given to and applied to the people of, of Israel. And we find details in the book of De Deuteronomy and other places about that, details about land ownership, about assault, about murder, about cities of refuge, uh, what they were and how they were to be used. And by the way, cities of refuge are not like the uh, sanctuary cities today, okay? That's, that's not what they were. It was never intended to be a place where you could go and be shielded from doing wrong. The cities of refuge were a place that those there were some questions, and it required due diligence and understanding and application before a decision was made, and so the cities of refuge were established. That was the point of them. Anyway, all of that is set forth in the Scriptures, and they were for ancient Israel, okay, the judicial law. If you get pulled over by the police and you pull out Deuteronomy and say, 
show me in here where I was speeding. Yeah, you're just going to take them off. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. So what about the other? Well, then there's the ceremonial law. That includes the dietary laws, uh, the kosher laws. It includes the sacred days like uh, Purim and, and, and Yom Kippur and others, uh, the kinds of sacrifices to be made and how and where and when they were to be offered and rules for priests and clothing and head covering and all of that. And these were all the ceremonial laws pertaining to ancient Judaism. And much of it, we read, pertained to life around the temple. Well, what happened in 70 A.D.? The temple was destroyed. There is no temple in Israel. And so, the development of rabbinic Judaism followed because the faithful Jewish life would continue, but without a temple. That's a ceremonial law. Christians are under neither the ceremonial law nor the judicial law of the Old Testament. Those laws were pointing to and they were fulfilled by the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. He is our jubilee. He is our atonement. He is our sacrifice. And what he declares to be clean is clean. But then there is the third, there is the moral law, and that's the basic, the most basic of the laws. It is encapsulated, of course, in the Ten Commandments, but it is, it is more than that. It's based on and it's reflective of the character and the nature of God. God is holy. We see that there, and he calls us to be holy. God values human life, all of it, and so he's a protector and a sustainer of life, and he calls us to the same. God uh, values uh, faithfulness in our relationships because he is faithful to us always. God values rights to property. He calls us to value that as well, honesty and integrity. And so God sets that forth, all of those things. The moral law is anchored in, in, in the very character and nature of God, and so it remains intact because God never changes Jesus very specifically said, what about the law? He did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so we can be counted as righteous in Christ because his life, in his life, he perfectly fulfilled the law. But he did not abolish it. He did not fulfill it. He did not fulfill it so that human beings could go on to live unholy, murderous, slanderous, selfish, lying lives. Praise God, I get to do all of that now without any worry. No, that's not what it is at all. We know that. Paul will say in chapter 7, verse 16, the law is good. He writes the same to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1, 8. The law is good. So what are we to do with the law today? How do we make use of it? What's required? Well, again, it's important because this passage is saying that we are under the law. What does that mean to be under the law? What are the uses of the law? How does that pertain? Because for some, it's just turned off. Well, that law was for other people. That's not for us. That's lawlessness. That is not what the gospel says. And so the scriptures show that the law tends to function in three different ways. John Calvin set it forth for the benefit of the church and the law's threefold use. And the first is, again, we come back to that mirror. It is a mirror. It reflects God's perfect righteousness and holiness. And it also reflects our shortcomings and our sinfulness. We know how a mirror works. You get dressed in the morning, you go eat breakfast, you get ready to go, and you look, and there's some jam on your shirt. See it in the mirror. So you take and you're going to wipe it off, but instead you smear it all over the place, and then you've got to get a new shirt. The purpose of the mirror is to show what, what's going on, what actually is. Augustine offers this insight. He says, the law bids us as we try to fulfill its requirements and become wearied in our weakness under it to know how to ask the help of grace. And so the law is meant to give knowledge of sin. That's what verse 20 is saying. We'll see it in chapter 4 and 5 and 7. It shows us our need for pardon and, 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 and it warns us of the danger. That if there's no pardon, then there is judgment. Even damnation. 
there is a concern. And it does that in order to lead us to repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ. And so it is a mirror, and it shows us both God, and it shows us ourselves, and it shows us that without any distortion. Mirrors are not my friend, but they are my friend. You may think the law isn't your friend, but it is. The law is good, and it tells us the truth. The second use of the law is described as the civil use, and it's used to restrain evil. That's what many of our civil laws are for, right? They're used to restrain evil. They, 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 they um, tell us what is wrong. They can't stop evil. A law doesn't have that power, but it can restrain by telling what is wrong and saying, and here's the penalty for the violation of this. So God's law cannot change a heart. But it can inhibit lawlessness to some extent by the threats of, of judgment. And especially if it's backed in, in, in some way by, by, by civil codes and, and, and it's administrated and there is indeed punishment for proven offenses. If there's a law that, there, that looting is illegal, but there is no punishment for looting, what are you going to have? More looting. If there's a law against embezzlement, but you only get a little slap of the hand if you embezzle. What are we going to have? More embezzlement. The law is intended to restrain evil, and it functions to secure civil order. It is there to protect the righteous. It is there to protect those who are trying to do right from those who are intent on doing wrong and bringing harm to others. That's what the law is for. The law is good. But there is a third use, and that use is a particularly pertinent to us. It is a guide into good works for believers. It tells us what God is pleased with, and God has planned in advance good works for us to do. We're saved by grace through faith, but for good works to do, Ephesians 2, uh, verse 10 and in that sense, the law functions kind of like a family code, okay? I bet your family had a code. Our family had a code. There were certain things not allowed. Well, Johnny down the street gets to do this. So what? That's not what we do. We are not doing that. Usually followed by a story about a cliff, right? <laughs> and if they go jump off the cliff, right? You got to... There's a family code, and this is the family code for us. This is how we are to live in responsive obedience to the Lord. Well, Jesus taught that his disciples were to be taught to do all that he had commanded, Matthew 28, 20. And Jesus taught that obedience to him was a, a proof of the reality of our love for him. If you love me, he said, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. That is to say, the law is good. So then, Christian is free from the law or the system of law for salvation. We've been set free from that because it was never going to get us there anyway. But the Christian is under the law as a rule of life. This then is how we are to live as followers of Christ. And so that's why Paul is so expressive when in the last uh, section we looked at when they're saying, so since, let me get this, Paul, you're saying that God's grace shines against the backdrop of human sin. So if we sin more, won't that just make more of God's glory? Wouldn't that be cool? And Paul says, God forbid, no, ne never, never, never. That is not it at all. So neither law nor lawlessness. Law cannot save us, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Verse 20, spotlighting how far away we actually are from God's standard of perfection. So the law shows us this is the standard, this is where you are. But rather than saying, so there's the law, you need to try harder and do better. It says, Christ fulfilled the law. 
on your behalf, and you need to flee to him for grace and mercy and forgiveness. Let me put it this way, a question for you. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? And we could go through the rest of that song. That's it. Lawlessness is without excuse, and lawlessness has no place in the life of a follower of Jesus. Jesus did not abolish the law. It's only when we understand that we have no merit to plead and that we have uh, no excuse to offer that we stand before God speechless so that every mouth may be stopped. And we understand that we're condemned if we are left to ourselves, and only then are we ready to hear the great news that picks up in verse 21, but now, and that's for next week, but that is a great passage. And it serves to motivate us in one other way. Let me see. Having known the forgiveness and grace of God in our life through Jesus Christ, we're not to hoard it. Don't monopolize the good news. It's not the secret. We don't go out the door saying, shh, remember, don't tell anybody. That's not how it works. We are sent out with this message. And we all know people who are around us who know enough about God's glory and holiness to leave them without excuse. We know that. Like us, their knowledge, their religion, their righteousness cannot save them. By works of the law, law, no human being will be justified. Only Christ can do that. John Stott helpfully suggests that their mouth is closed in guilt. Let our mouth be open in testimony. At Calvary, we stand in awe of perfect righteousness, holy justice, unerring judgment. We can offer no excuse or justification for our sin. We are completely at the mercy of a sovereign creator and king. And yet the gospel assures us. We, we confessed our sin this morning and we heard the assurance of pardon that by God's arm of redemption. It's another way of talking about Jesus and what he did. God's arm of redemption reached down to us in Jesus so that we're no longer enemies of God. We're his adopted children. And this is so important to keep at the forefront of our minds and hearts that the Lord instituted Holy Communion, the Lord's Supper, that it would serve for us that ongoing reminder and help that the gospel and only the gospel is the message of salvation that Christ alone and we run and we flee to him we leave our blame and excuses and justifications aside and we go to Christ and what did he have to do well he gave his body he shed his blood on the cross to accomplish completely our salvation. And so the invitation to the Lord's Supper is always this. It is to all who profess the name of Jesus Christ in faith, who have repented of their sin and desire his help to live a life that is godly and holy unto him. For all of those, this free invitation is offered to come, to participate in the Lord's Supper, to eat and drink because it's a means of grace. God is with us and he is for us to help us every step of the way. If you have not yet put your trust in Christ, if you're still hanging on to, to something else, even a little bit, like may, maybe I'll be okay, to, then, then you're encouraged to not. Because it is intended to be a means of grace and blessing to his children, though we stumble and fall. But for those 
who are righteous in their own sight, who have not yet come to say, Jesus, it is you that I need, then there is a danger in receiving the bread and cup and not discerning the Lord's body and blood in it. So that would be for you to know. But please hear me. Do not think that unless I've got every sin completely taken care of, I can't come. That is not true. That is not true. We come as we are by the blood of Christ and his grace to us. And we come hungry for more righteousness in him. So Paul says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that in the night in which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body. It's given for you. Do this whenever you eat it. And remember me. And then in the same way, after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it. And remember me. For when you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, Father, we pray that you would set apart now this bread and cup to this holy purpose to bless your people. For we come with humble hearts. We come with an eagerness to commune at your table as your children. By grace, through faith in Christ Jesus, who gave his blood and his body and rose again on the third day, that we would rest in him. We pray in his name, amen. So indeed, taking the bread as um, we would do, Jesus gave thanks as we have just done. He broke it and he uh, distributed it. They would eat, feed on him by faith. The church of Jesus Christ has been doing that same thing for nearly 2,000 years. And we do it in faith. call to worship, we heard the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 15, that I pass on to you that which I also received. It is of first importance. Christ died for our sins according, in accordance with the Scriptures. He was buried. He was raised again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. The gospel is set forth in a very tangible way that we would see, that we would hold, that we would taste the gospel. That Jesus gave his body and he gave his blood on our behalf. That we would know the righteousness of God through him. Receive with thanksgiving the body of Christ given for you. In the same way after supper... Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood given for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. So Paul wrote these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised.
the sweetness of Jesus Christ. Drink deeply of him. Pray with me. Father, we thank you that it's not through the law that we are saved because that's impossible. And what a horrible burden that only Jesus kept the law perfectly. And what a great thing because because he did, he could die on the cross for our sins. But we're still under the law and that's a good thing. Because it shows us our sin and shows God's holiness and shows our desperate need for the gospel, not just once, but again and again and again. We need God's grace. Restrains evil. Things could be so worse, as bad as they are. And then, Father, it gives us that that God to live lives that would be pleasing to you, to live the best life, not according to the flesh, not according to the culture, but that we would walk in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Again, Father, we need more and more of your grace to do that. And as Father, as we understand all of that, may that compel us to love you more, to love others more, and to tell others about the sweetness of Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen.
This is God's blessing from 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.